Hey everyone, it's Bill with St. Peter Woodworking. Okay, so this week we're going back in time. We're going back to a job I did about 14 years ago for a client. It was taken almost like taking a four by four and completely twisting it. Um, it's something I did. It's something I came up with, a technique that I came up to do it. I did a video on this about, oh, I want to say 13, 14 years ago. And I'm just kind of trying to sharpen my skills again, make sure I didn't forget how to do it. And let's see how it comes out. All right, so we're gonna be making a small coffee table. And the first thing we're doing is cutting all of our stock to length. In this case, I've already made a leg that we're doing. It's, it's a cool leg. Um, I sort of, I wouldn't say I invented how to do this, but I was, uh, I, di I did come up with, it, with this about 13 years ago. It was almost like taking a four by four and just twisting it. Um, so I found out a way to do it. I'm gonna walk you through it on how I made these legs. And the first thing I'm gonna do is cut these things to 18 inches and we'll get started on it. So yeah, after I got all my blanks all glued together, I basically made a three and a half by three and a half in this case. The first thing I wanna do is put my mortises in there while the stock is square. Everything's square, so I wanna put my all the mortises in. This is where I'm actually taking and using the bandsaw to narrow up the, the knee. I'm gonna call the square spot on the top of the leg the knee because I'm actually turning the rest of this leg into a cylinder. So I'm gonna lose a lot of that circumference and I wanna be able to blend that into the corners of the knee. So here we're going to be just kind of taking down the rest of the leg, turning it into a cylinder and getting ready to start carving our curve. So what I'll be doing next is I'm actually going to, as I'm getting this cylinder down to size, I'm going to turn that, if this was a longer leg, if this was like a, a dining room table, I would do it a, a full turn, which would be four quarters. In this case, it's shorter. And without talking in a different language here, I'm basically taking the cylinder. I've turned it into thirds. Before I did that, and I still had a square stock, I made an X at the bottom foot. So I knew where my corners once were. By having where the corners once were, I now have taken it where I can actually mark out my center of the knee, which is a square spot at the top of the leg. And that's where the cove, which is the low point of the curve, is gonna blend into, which is the center of the knee. And here it's kind of self-explanatory. Now it's all starting to come together. I'm taking some double-sided tape. I'm going from the one corner and I'm going just back up to the center of the knee. And that's gonna be this low point of my cove. And it starts to sound confused and it starts, but once you actually have this in front of you, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy. So the problem I had was, okay, how do I go up through the cove with a grinder and keep my elevation consistent? Well, I just made this little jig. I put it in a drill press. I set it to about a half inch deep and I went all the way up there with all these little holes. Didn't take long. It looks like it might've taken forever. That way there, I have something to go to as I'm curving it out. Now, the next step, is to make my high point of the cove. The high point is coming off each corner. And again, round and down around. So I have a two thirds twist. And again, you can kind of see here, I started right at the corner and I come back. That is the high point. You don't want to touch that with a grinder. We've turned that on the cylinder. It's all going to be consistent now. And that point stays the same. You, you don't want to mess with that. Again, I think once you get this in front of you, it's pretty self-explanatory. I couldn't grind on this on the lathe without having something holding the lathe from spinning on me. So I just went and grabbed an old ratchet strap, put it around the, the lathe and tightened it up. That way there I could kind of twist it by hand manually and just kind of grind away. This is just a typical grinder you can buy at most woodworking stores. Grinder head rather, the, the grinder can be any four inch grinder. And I'm just going in there and I'm just barely taking out those little holes that were all a half inch deep off the drill press and I'm forming my leg. I'm basically just kind of like, almost like clay where I'm starting to form it. And then I'm gonna come back with the finish sander and just start finally kind of sanding it in there. I do have a thicker pad on this sander so it's a little bit more squishier so to say, to kind of get in there on the curves and whatnot. But you're basically just taking it now and cleaning it all up. It, it's not a tremendous amount of work. I can get through one of these legs in about an hour. But as you can see, that high point now is trying to go into my corner and just blend into that corner up there and just, just making it look like it all flowed together perfectly without having any type of a transition at the knee um, coming down onto the leg. It's kind of hard to explain, but I think by looking at it and, and the way I've kind of laid it out, it's really not it's really not too bad. A little bit of hand sanding at the end there 
and the legs are pretty much done. So we're just building a coffee table here. I'm just kind of laying it out on the bottom of the table and trying to see the size I, I wanted. And now it's back to the mortise and tenons. I'd already done the mortises earlier. So it's all I have to do now is the tenons. Getting the tenons all made here on our dado saw. This is just a little saw we have set up just for doing dados. It's um, dedicated just for that. So we don't have to keep changing the dado head. And then I wanted to put a little detail on the bottom of this thing. I wanted to put a foot plate that went across the bottom of both legs. And then I wanted to put little feet below it, which are kind of in line with the legs. And you'll see here in a minute how I kind of did that. So it was basically taking about a three and a half by three and a half inch block and turning it into an octagon, like you see here. Spacing them on there, I was trying to look at the spacing and I almost forgot to wait. These have to be lined up with the legs. Otherwise the legs will come down to that foot block and that will look kind of funny. So I had to kind of re recalculate here and get, get that set up. I'm putting a little bead around the bottom of these feet. Um, I'm gonna call the long piece that goes from leg to leg the footboard. And then I'm gonna put a bead around it as well. And then I'm gonna nail the two together and assemble them to the actual table. So here I'm just putting the bead bit in and just kind of determining the, the type of bead I want, the height I want it at. And that's all whatever you wanna make it look like. You could, I, I could have done three beads probably. I could have made it look, you know, however I want. You don't even have to do a bead if you wanna leave it flush. That would be totally up to you, but. Now, I want to make sure that even though I have a roller bearing on this bit because the piece is so small, I still want to go ahead and bury that router head in the in the fence. I, I just like to keep it back there and because the piece is so small and my hands are kind of close there, I, I like to keep it keep it somewhat safe. I've been doing woodworking for almost 40 years and still have all my fingers. So when you are routing a piece like this, I always like to start with the end grain. That way there you don't have tear out. You always start with the end grain when you're routing a piece and you, you don't get the tear out at the end. So here I've never learned this little thing that happens for some reason, but I'll put a piece of couple pieces of wood on top of the sander and I'll start sanding and there they go. They all end up on the floor, but one of these days I'll learn. So once we get all the piece sanded, we're, you know, it's time to go back. And I remember the days of watching Norm Abram with a nail gun and a bunch of wood in his shop up in Massachusetts. He did a lot with a nail gun. And I kind of, this kind of reminded me of that, just a, a Norm Abram shot of nail gun, wood glue, and some wood. But this is all it takes is a couple, couple little nails on here because we're going to end up putting screws all the way up through both of them right into the leg. Just getting everything. I've already dry fitted everything. I know it's all going to fit. Putting the glue in the tenons, in the mortises rather. I don't get too carried away with making sure I got glue all over each tenon. I try to not have squeezes out so i'm trying not to put the glue on the ins uh, you know too close to the cheek of the of the apron otherwise you're going in there and cleaning that all out and um it doesn't take a whole lot of glue to to hold this stuff together this this the, the glue we use today is are pretty impressive stuff so here i'm just clamping it up again i did this table out of mahogany easier to carve easier to work with i could have done it out of probably any type of wood but i really like the mahogany on the lathe and with a grinder and stuff and turning this stuff so it's coming out good it's it's kind of hard when you've got a, a, a cylinder like that that you've turned to get everything square but it's basically coming to the point where it's just by eye here i am putting these other clamps on lower down to kind of squeeze in those legs a little bit because they weren't quite tight up at the knee and I'm just adding these here. And once I get it all clamped up, we'll just let it set overnight probably and I'll come back to it first thing in the morning and start putting this table together. Here, I'm just getting the top all ready to go. Again, using that, I, I haven't changed the elevation in my in my router. Uh, that bead is still at the same height that I did the feet with. And I'm just kind of transferring that up to the top of the table here. And you're probably wondering why I'm not having help with this, but it's actually, it was actually easier than it looks here. It wasn't that heavy of a piece. And we do have several woodworkers here in the shop. Well, we have three rather. We all kind of work on our own projects. Sometimes we'll ask for help if something's too heavy to work with and whatnot, but you'll notice in a lot of the videos, we're just kind of doing our own thing and moseying along. So we're just getting all the final sanding done, um, kind of going through everything, making sure there's no scratches and, and dings and whatnot. I'm using a Rotex here. Uh, which is a six inch sander. It's a little aggressive. It's, you know, it's 120 grit sandpaper. I'm going to bring this down to about 150 with a finished sander only because we're putting a lacquer finish on this and lacquer seems to stick to 150. Okay. 
Sometimes they recommend only going to 120, but I find that I can see the scratches in the mahogany wood at 120, and the woods are so slight bit softer so I feel like it's going to kind of bind to it so I just go with the 150 and here we're just putting in a little bit of corner braces a little added support it's a coffee table you never know when someone's going to sit on it or stand on it to change the light bulb it's a little detail I like to do and you've seen tables that are 300 years old that still have the same little corner pieces and a lot of people think they don't need it um, because their mortise and tendons are strong enough but I just like to do it anyway it's just an added touch and we'll put our stamp on it saying that we made it here at St. Pierre Woodworking in Floyd, Virginia and start putting this thing together. Make sure I like it. You're not going to see here in the video, but one of my employees will come over and look at it just to put another set of eyes on it and double check to see what I missed. And then we'll fix it up and re-sand and smooth all our edges. And this thing is ready to go in the spray booth. After taking it out of the booth, again, we put a lacquer finish on it. It's a durable finish. Um, I could I could use an oil. I could do, but a lot of the things we do here, um, we're trying to move them through the shop. We have other people working. It's hard for things to dry you know, if it's something that takes a long time to dry because we can't make dust. So we do run it through our spray booth and usually we can put a piece through in just a couple hours and have it done. And we've, we're finally done. Put the feet on the bottom. This thing is complete and ready to hit the showroom for sale. Good to know I can still do it. Um, it's been 15 years since I've done one of these before, but I'm glad the way it came out. I might do another one, but this time I might just do a like a kitchen table or something. I enjoy this. Thanks for watching. Now, if you want to see us turning centuries old wood into a beautiful table, check this out.